welcome back everybody to the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John and this is episode 198. As always, if you have questions, email them to the podcast at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Each week I sit down, I do my best to answer each and every one of the questions. Uh, sometimes there's questions that they're a little difficult for me to answer, but I do my best to answer each and every question. I often do email people uh, the answers, and very often people follow up at danjohnuniversity.com in our forum, and I'm, I really appreciate it when I get the follow-up. I ask a lot of the time, let me know how this went, let me know how this did, and I really appreciate when people get back to me. You know, and I'll be honest, sometimes, like in everything in life, you know, I have advice, and it's not always, doesn't always work. Sometimes I think uh, that there's more to the situation than I know, and, and that happens. So the more information you can give me, the better it helps. Uh, let's begin uh, with our first question from Julian. Julian says, hey, Dan, I wanted to get your take on the workout that shall not be named style events. And then there's a run followed by a bunch of pull-ups, a bunch of pull-ups, a bunch of squats, another run. I'm training for this and for the Secret Service Snatch Test simultaneously uh, because, you know, that's what you do. The Secret Service Snatch Test is something I, I think is pretty good. Uh, I, I've done it uh, back when I first started with kettlebells. Uh, Pavel made a good point, and I still think there's truth to it. Now, <laughs> you, you might not like what I'm about to say, but... He believes and he, he reinforces it in his book, uh, Return of the Kettlebell, which has some really excellent parts to it. Um, and, and, and I do like the book. Uh, I don't know why anybody would ever want more programming. My only knock on the book would be the ballistic blocks. And that's only because uh, he goes two, four, six, eight on the, uh, the clean and, and kind of jerk uh, ballistics. And for most of my time, uh, ascending reps is just really hard. Um, I, I don't, I mean, my, my response to that would be to do something like two, three, five, two, three, five, two, three, five, two, three, five, eight, two, three, five, eight, two, three, five, eight, something like that, where there is a little bit of oscillation in those ballistic reps. Most adults I work with like descending reps, uh, for a hard program. That's my experience, but you know, Every, everybody's different. Uh, Pavel and I had a conversation years ago that I might be the only person who ever actually did the program as written. And, and that's why I feel like I have good feedback. Um, the Secret Service Snatch Test, you take, uh, I'm just going to say the men's standards, and I apologize uh, for not having every standard. I don't have the master's 85 plus standards. Uh, it, it, sometimes people ask me, why don't I have more standards? I I don't, I just don't have them, but you take the 24 kilo kettlebell and you snatch it 200 times in 10 minutes. Now, Pavel's standard for the return of the kettlebell was that you were to do that, snatch the 24, 200 times in 10 minutes and press with one arm, a, a kettlebell that's half your body weight. Um, Anthony Barbiero and I years ago did this, um, uh, when, when this book came out. And I'll be honest with you, uh, all we had was the uh, 48 kilo bell, and that had been pretty close to my, half my body weight at the time. I pressed it, with, you know, that was easy. Uh, and then I got to tell you, when you get to the five minute mark uh, of of a 10 minute, uh, the 10 minute secret service snatch test, um, you know, it, it, it's it's illuminating. Fortunately, I was able to get a, a, a fair number of reps in the first five minutes. Um, when, when we do the certs, the, the RKC certs, we expect people to do uh, in five minutes, get 100 reps. Uh, most of the people I train or like myself, we can get that closer to four minutes and my females under four, four minutes, my female athletes under four minutes. So that when you roll into that five minute mark on the secret service test, you're looking at, you're, you're in, you're in that 120, 125 range. 
and then you have five minutes or, or whatever, get to the 200. And that's still tough, but that means you can rest. It means you can put the bell down and, you know, uh, in, in our case, in, in both uh, Anthony and I, I, as I recall, it was our, uh, it was our lungs that were killing us. And then, then they're right around the 150 mark, uh, the lockout starts getting uh, a little bit scary. Put the bell down, re relax, do the math, figure out how much time you do and, and finish it. So this person wants to do the workout, a hard workout that shall not be named and the Secret Service snatch test. I'll say this. I don't say it enough. And that's a mistake I've been making for a while on the podcast. I think the kettlebell snatch uh, is, it's weird because it's almost like an AU. It's either the most overrated exercise in history or it's the most underrated history uh, exercise, un underappreciated exercise. Of it. There's not a lot of moderation on it. And I, I think the kettlebell snatch for that weird kind of heart rate that you get from it, um, your, your heart rate goes through the roof. You kind of wonder why, because, you know, you're not, you're not like sprinting up a hill or you're not chasing somebody down a 400 meter, but you sweat hard, you get really tired. You, uh, it really is what Leonard Schwartz talked about in heavy hands. It's what Steve Reeve talked about in power walking. It is that whole body cardiovascular movement under load. So you're getting all the qualities at once. So yeah, I would say that uh, I I have so for Julian. Let me just answer this in my own way because that's what's going to happen. Uh, I like the Secret Service snatch test. I think once you've done the twenty four kilo, uh, two hundred reps in ten minutes, I mean I, you might never have to do it again. But if you go to a cert and someone says you have to do a hundred in five minutes, you kind of go, yeah, okay, I got that. And I do like the idea of pressing the, the half body weight bell in the same half an hour because I just think that's a, a good combination. It would prove that you have a, a fairly strong grasp of your cardiovascular abilities at the time and you're still fairly strong. For this other stuff, this this the, the workout that shall not be named, and I'll tell you the reason, I, I, everyone thinks I'm joking when I say that, but if I use that label, we'll get all kinds of people uh, hate, hate, love it. Okay. It's CrossFit. And the problem is uh, a friend of mine uh, was just telling me the other day, his wife got into this. Um, she went to a, she started going to the gym and now she's broken. Uh, she did the workout. She learned all the things he was saying. Yeah. Within about two weeks, she was, she was, she was an expert just like me, you know, after my, I've been lifting weights since 1965 and she was just as qualified as I was after two weeks. She was you know, uh, her coach was an expert in all fields and then she got broken and now she has to get fixed. And I got to tell you, every decade after 20, uh, fixing physical injuries gets harder and harder and harder. Um, I, I taught the CrossFit, the original CrossFitters, how to do the Olympic lifts. Uh, I liked the programming that CrossFit did when Lauren uh, was doing it. I thought she had a real sound grasp of things. She had very, she, she basically hovered around certain workouts and certain templates that I thought were pretty valuable. She had a nice, like, like I can remember back early in the day, you would practice, there were certain days you would practice the snatch. You would, okay, here is the Olympic snatch, practice it. And that was the workout. There were other days it was like, I remember one workout was three sets of five in the back squat, post your load. And it was like, that was it. I thought that was a pretty good idea. Uh, the push-ups uh, were relatively at a good level. The pull-ups at a good level. But then once it became a little bit bigger, once it became a lot more aggressive, and of course, uh, you know, some of the articles that would post politically, I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I struggle. I, I struggle with some of the politics. Um, and, and it wasn't because it was a certain, it was just, you know, I, I just didn't think it was an appropriate place to put it. Um, when it started sliding down certain things, uh, you know, I, I grew up in a home with disabled American veterans. And, and so when people get, uh, 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 when people talk about the military in certain ways, I find it difficult for my heart. Are there values to CrossFit? When I 
when I first, you know, sat down with Greg, we had lunch together, Greg Glassman, and I said to him, I would be willing to experiment with CrossFit in a high school setting, and we did. And uh, very quickly, I had to walk away from it because uh, the injuries were so high. Um, the upside is I learned that you know, like box jumps. Okay, everyone loves box jumps. But, you know, when you're working with a general population, which I did in my in my strength and conditioning classes, we had athletes. We had a varsity football program. You know, we had female athletes class. We had we all kind of, but then we had the general. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm not throwing box jumps under the, <laughs> under the bus or anything. But, you know, if you're going to teach box jumps, there is a high level of coaching of teaching um, you've got to build up to it there's got to be a lot of explanation and the athlete has to be able to moderate when they're going to go you know when they're going to raise the dial up and if they start having sloppy reps there there can be no sloppy reps with some exercises the olympic lifts you can't have sloppy reps heavy back squats you can't have sloppy reps uh, any sport you can't have sloppy reps uh, the emphasis on burpees showed up right after that. And, you know, uh, Royal Burpee, the inventor of the burpee, told us we should do four. And four is a good number for burpees. Um, you know, doing a 10,000 burpee challenge might be interesting, but you you might pay a high price on the injury side for that. When, when CrossFit was joking about this thing called rhabdomyolysis, I had a friend who got it. And uh, it's not a joking matter. Uh, it's it's a very dangerous thing, and it's not something you, you laugh at. Having people puke and train a lot uh, can really r lead to a lot of issues, as I've discovered later. Hey, man, I, I I've I mean, I've trained to the point that I've gotten nauseous. I may have puked. A, a, I don't really I don't think I've ever puked puke in a gym setting, but I've gotten nauseous. And when I was young. It, you know, that's kind of how you train because you're, you know, you're all, we were just a bunch of, you know, young bulls, I guess. And just, you know, if you can do this, I can do more. But there are people that puking is going to have some issues with them. And, um, you know, it's going to lead to some kinds of uh, issues with body and some kinds of physical issues. And, of course, the throat issues. Um, uh, so, no, I'm, I'm not a fan of this. Julian, I, I can't really recommend, I can't recommend you, you you go after either of these goals necessarily. But I got to tell you this, if I was to pick one of your goals, the Secret Service Snatch Test taught me a lot about myself. Uh, anytime you're fighting against the uh, the clock for 10 minutes, <laughs> it's interesting. I, I, did, uh, I did two of those uh, competitions called Gear of Voice Sport. Uh, I used the 32 kilo bells. And I, and I will, and that, by the way, with, with the Secret Service test, you're allowed as many hand switches with what you want. In GS, at least when I did it, you snatch with one hand, and then you had one hand switch, and you, that's, that was it. And I got to tell you, that was eye-opening. Uh, I didn't use the GS techniques uh, because I, I didn't need to learn an, another sport. And it's a sport. GS is a sport. So when they do things in uh, Gear of Voice Sport, they are they are competing to do well in the sport itself. Um, in the same way that you know, if I'm doing a workshop about the discus throw, I don't necessarily think. Uh, I mean, I'm teaching the discus throw, and it's not going to, even though it might help you with your balance, your speed, your strength. There's much easier ways for the bulk of the population to get those qualities. So I'm not necessarily a fan of your question. Uh, I do my best to answer them as I say every week, but, and, and I hope there was some clarity there. There's going to be a problem. There's going to be, <laughs> there's going to be backlash from me even talking about uh, the workout that shall not be named because people are, uh, buy into it at an extremely emotional level. Um, very much like some fans, uh, just as I was coming in here, I was on, I was listening to the radio about some fans uh, racially taunting an athlete. And uh, that, that really bothers me. Just because you pay a ticket doesn't mean you have the right to say anything you want. Um, 
very few places in life allow that. Uh, uh, so, I mean, I, I, I worry that, you know, when, when I talk about certain things, I, I get some pushback from people and it's very negative. Uh, so I hope I helped. It's not the best. I know it's not the best answer I ever had. And I apologize for that. Uh, I didn't necessarily want to answer that question, but I, I thought I should. Because, and I do appreciate you asking it. And I hope at some level that helps somebody. Okay. Thank you, Julie. We got a question from Nathan. And uh, given that golf is a rotational sport, I'm wondering if I should incorporate rotational moves into my regular kettlebell training. No. No, don't do that. Uh, I can never, I, I am never a fan of ballistic rotation with kettlebells, barbells, uh, dumbbells. Uh, I know it's the big thing online. You see people do it all the time. Um, I, I don't think it's a good idea. Now, the reason I think that is, you know, I started throwing the discus in 1970. I retired officially uh, in 2011. And uh, I still coach. Uh, in fact, my phone was pinging not long ago. Uh, my athletes want to get together and go throw. You know, I threw 10 to 15,000 times a year in the ring. Um, I tried every rotational exercise that had ever been invented up to the time. None of them carried over. Uh, I will take you back uh, to a 1964 Strength and Health article I read about uh, uh, golf and track and field. And he, the author referenced uh, uh, Harry Paschal, who wrote the Bosco series, who died the week I was born, which I always think is kind of funny. And Pascal said the best way to build rotational straining, uh, ro rotational strength was to squat, deadlift, and do the Olympic lifts. This article from 1964 said the best way to train for track and fields rotational events was the squat family, the deadlift family, and the Olympic lifts, and I still think that's true. With kettlebells, uh, there is a book called Kettlebells for Golf. The one thing they do add in this, and, and I would be, better, I'd be okay with this, is they add the windmill family and variations. Uh, but a lot of that is, is to make sure that the whole system stays pliable and flexible. And what I liked about the windmill when I first started to do it is, uh, many of us will windmill on one side and we are, you know, we are, we are the cover, cover model of windmill monthly. And then you go to the other side and we look like a broken down sailboat. You know, all the masts are broken and the rigging. One of the nice things about the windmill is it gives you a chance to assess both sides of, uh, of your rotation without any ballistic issues. So I'm answering the question, but you go on, okay? Um, which is, uh, he goes on to say his regular, uh, Nathan says, uh, his regular kettlebell training, which is focused on the basic bilateral moves and some unilateral movements. I, I see on the inter internet, the internet's not always a good place to go, but okay. Uh, however, that a lot of trainers seem almost scared of rotational work due to the, due to the risk of spine injuries. Yeah, uh, when, uh, when I work with Stu McGill, Stu really supports my idea of golfers doing, golfers, discus throwers, kickers, strikers, everybody, suitcase carries. And, I, and I'm looking here, I'm looking here for suitcase carries and I don't see it. Uh, if I was working with golfers or discus throwers, the only exercise I might do with them is suitcase carries. If, if oh, sorry, if I was given that, you can only do one exercise. Sorry, I forgot the, forgot the intro to the question. Uh, the answer, if I can only do one exercise with discus throwers, say, or uh, golfers, it'd be the suitcase carry because you need that. You need to be strong in every step you take as the whole body, you know, the, as that whole body swings around, your hips come forward, your shoulders, you know, uh, go the opposite way. Um, I think that is the best way to build that weird, you know, uh, superstructure of the human body to make it better for throwing the discus far, hitting the ball far. Uh, but he adds an important question, ladies and gentlemen. This is important. 
If I'm not yet in the best shape and I'm using kettlebells because they're effective while safer, am I making a mistake by trying rotational movements? That is, am I already getting all I need for my level of golf with the basics? Right. Uh, yes. Uh, the basics, the foundations, uh, and this can be the broadest answer of any question I've ever done. Those are always the correct answer. The basics, the foundational movements are always the best way to approach uh, anything in your career. Um, Dave Davis wrote that article for Track Technique back in March and April of 1974, where he said that the Olympic lifting three, the press, the snatch, the clean and jerk, the powerlifting three, the bench press, the squat, and the deadlift are the best foundation for training for anybody, anything they do. If you throw in a loaded carry like the suitcase carry, farm a walk, sled pull, you know, push, you know, push a car, push a prowler, you know, that's going to carry you a long ways in your career. When you start to get at all sports specific, it, oh, I tell you, it, it really, you know, if you, if you have, I, mean, I remember someone telling me years and years ago, and I got to be careful about saying this out loud because someone might try this, but. Rat poison, I guess at some level, is a great uh, way to burn fat. I don't, please don't take, okay, don't. But it's, and, and then the author went on, it's all about the dosage. And I went, well, yeah, I mean, I don't trust myself with this. I'm sure, I mean, everything's all about the dosage. Uh, with me, specific training is all about the dosage. And it takes me right back to, you know, kind of the rat poison thing. I'm not good enough to program specific training for most people. It. Um, I'm working with a discus thrower now, and she's in her third full year with me. And I talked to her the other day about this fall where to do some overweight discus throwing. And uh, she said to me, why? Why didn't we do this before? And I said, well, you weren't yet ready for it. And when I say overweight... She's going to throw, She's a, she throws the one kilo discus, and we're going to have her throw the 1.5, the Masters Men's 50 to 59 discus. And it took me three years of her teaching her the Olympic lifts, uh, the front squat, the loaded carry family, uh, an appropriate modern technique to finally move up to a little bit more specific weight training, throwing the 1.5 discus. And even then, I'm worried it's too heavy, but we're not going to worry about that on this podcast. Uh, but it took three years to, and she's a very good thrower, to be able to handle that. So, Nathan, you can live for a long time on the basics, the fundamentals, and do really well. Um, I would love to see you uh, do the basics, and and you know, and I'm and I'm going to give you an idea, but if I it's an idea that we did out of, uh, uh, you know, this is obviously a track idea, but it's called mixed training. It comes from Peter Sheen. And I love this. In fact, Pavel talked about this in the early 2000s because this is how I trained. I would take a kettlebell out to the field with me when I was throwing the discus. Um, I would throw the discus 10 times and I would do clean and press. I'd throw the discus 10 times. I would do swings, throw a discus 10 times, and I would do um, goblet squats or whatever, it's not important. I would suggest you go out to the driving range, you know, hit uh, half a bucket of balls. Um, if you if you don't, I mean, I wouldn't worry about what people thought, but, you know, do some goblet squats. Hit the other half of the go uh, uh, bucket of balls. Uh, do some swings. Uh, get the next bucket of balls. Hit some of them uh, goofy style, the opposite way. Uh, get yourself an additional club or, or like one one of my friends told me just use a hockey stick and went oh um, I, which i thought was hilarious in a very uh you know uh, I, I think there's a movie about uh, uh, a gentleman using hockey sticks to hit the golf ball uh, uh mr madison um uh, happy gilmore happy gilmore um yeah i, I you know it just you know hit some the other side uh just because I, I think there's some, I have my discus throwers uh, throw left-handed a few throws just to, you know, get the shake up the shake up the brain a little bit, you know, you know, give you something to think about. Um, so go to the driving range, you know, hit some balls, do some kettlebells. 
I don't think that's a uh, kettlebells. Kettlebells. I, I don't think that's a bad idea. Try it. Get back to me. Okay. Thank you. Well, Dunty's back. Um, uh, he asks a lot of questions, and I'm always happy to answer. Uh, Dan, how did you and Pavel work together on Easy Strength? Did you co-write it by going back and forth, or maybe you each had a certain uh, set of shared topics to provide? Most times, it seems it really does seem like it flows having a conversation, and I can tell you what parts of the book those are. Uh, taking turns, but at other times, it seems like you're making unrelated references that got edited together. Exactly what happened. I love hearing how books came together, the story about how uh, books come together. But you know what? I got to tell you, I like this question. I don't think I'm going to hurt any feelings, so it's okay. So John Duquesne, the owner of Dragon Door, said to Pavel and I, let's make a book easy strength. And I thought, this is a great idea. What I didn't know is in behind the scenes, that John and Powell were were having that uh, they were having some issues, okay, and that formed that is what the breakup between the RKC and Strong First. Both are outstanding organizations. It makes no sense to me at all why they're separate organizations. Uh, I this this is me speaking. We teach basically the same curriculum, um, but you know. I, I, I certainly understand it. Uh, this this happens. Well, well, as the book was going to the editing process, we ran into a real um, we ran into a real issue. We, we were having these massive gaps in time. You know, uh, I'm very good about knocking things out, but both of them were busy with other projects. So I would write my stuff. There'd be a there'd be a couple month break of nothing. Then I'd get a flood of new information. I'd, I'd write up <clears throat> responses to it, questions answered, and it was great. And that's that's the parts of the book that I think flowed the best. Then we hired a, se a series of editors uh, because there was, and I was hoping you would, an editor would fix the grammar, <clears throat> mistaken letter. You know, so we, you know, no matter what you do, you make mistakes. You know, two, two, two. That happens a lot. Uh, when you're writing, sometimes, you know, and becomes and a lot of times in the opposite. Those kind of things. Those obvious. Well, we had the first two editors we hired rewrote the book. <laughs> One kept changing. Like, I would tell a story about this thing. They would change the ending of the story, which, you know, probably isn't a good idea when the story was trying to make a point about, you know, how little effort. So finally, John, God bless him, John Duquesne stepped up and edited the book himself. And we only had one. I was down with uh, a Major League Baseball team when we did the podcast, the one single podcast before everything, uh, before the big uh, break between uh, uh, Strong First and Dragon Door. And I was down working with the Major League Baseball team. And you know when you sense something's happening, but you don't know everything? And of course, not long after that was the big break, and it was it was it was an ugly time. Um, Easy strength is a was an unfinished product, and that's why I wrote the book, Easy Strength Omni Book, um, available at easystrengthomnibook.com. Uh, I because there was some gaps in there. The upside for me, and I, I got to tell you, and I can't thank Pavel enough and John Duquesne. Pavel asked some of the best questions I've ever heard in my life. And the reason I like these questions, for example, he, when, and I've talked about this before in the podcast, obviously, when he said, what's the role of the strength coach? And I said, hey, man, teach keep people straight, yay. And they said, no, 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 what's the impact? It took me a year to answer that question, a year. Uh, somewhere in, in my files over there, I have the yellow legal pads where I kept trying to come up with an interesting way a, a, a simple, but a simple way to explain the impact of the strength coach, but elegant enough so that if you're a, an American football player or special forces, you would know that you shouldn't train like a discus thrower and a, a discus thrower or a sprinter would know you can't train like a, you know, a PE class. And so that's where the quadrants one, two, three, and four came from. That was great. Pavel asked me a number of questions, and, and I really, there's some questions, there's some things in the book about in-season training, which 
I think I'm, I think I'm good about, and you know, I'm, <laughs> as I'm talking about this, I had to, uh, I wouldn't say I yelled at my athlete today. It wasn't yelling. It was firm. I, I kind of dadded them a little bit about they want to do more and more. Well, we got the nationals coming up, you know, the hay's in the barn. If you want to do more, do more. You'll, we'll do more in August, September, October, not May, June, July, okay? Because this is the height of the season, you know. Um, I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that conversation I had with Pavel. I enjoyed those insights. Um, uh, that workshop we did where Marty Gallagher showed up, Bud Jeffrey showed up. It was, you know, it was it was amazing. And uh, if if I have any. I wish I could do overs in my life. I wish I could have helped somehow more uh, with the Strongford and Dragador split. I, I wish that would have never happened. Um, it, you know, a lot of people, a lot of good friends aren't friends anymore because of that. A lot of, a lot of quality people got lost. A lot of, a lot of quality stuff got lost in the in in that breakup, and it and it's sad. Um, you know, uh, you know, yeah, I, I was going to say, uh, something that mentally my brain just said that's inappropriate, but, uh, there's no, there, there's no, there's no place for me to make a joke on this. Um, so that, that's the story. Uh, and, and, then, uh, as, uh, yeah, where that one comedian always says, I'm sticking to it. So thank you. Great question. I hope I answered the question. If you need follow up, simply ask, and I'll be I'll be honored to to follow up more. But we never did get the second volume out. We never did clarify things. But I did my best with the Easy Strength Omni book. Okay, thanks. Okay, Jake says this. My question involves working well with others. I imagine that during your professional careers, you have dealt with administrators. Yeah, I was one too. I was an administrator with insensible strategies and misplaced priorities. How do, have you dealt with administrators when you are tasked by them to perform work you truly believe to be of poor quality and a waste of time and effort? When you have done what you have voiced your concerns about this type of work and still seen instructed to proceed with these tasks, you sound like your military guy. Uh, I took a course years ago. I talk about it in Easy Strength on the book. I talk about it a lot. It was called Managing Multiple Priorities. And I got to tell you, one of the best things I ever did was there was a little section in there where they talked about when you have a, when you get a job and let's just pretend this is the, you, you always keep your job description with you. And whenever you go to meetings, you always write down, or when you get an email, you always write down what your boss or administrator is asking for. Okay. So there's two things here. First, if you have a job description, this does help. Now, if you have annual meetings or you have that kind of thing, I, I want you from now on to list out what your administrator, your boss, your manager are telling you what they want to do. And you write them down. And then, this, this is a very simple question. So this is why I'm, I, this seems like an odd question, but it's, it's easy for me to answer. Then you type up at the beginning of the year, like if I'm a, a, a teacher and the principal says, we want one, two, three, four, five. These are our goals for the year. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. After I I get back to my office, I type up the ten things they want me to do. If I have a job description, I, I, I reference that too, back and forth, a little conversation, and I send that email to my boss, and I make a hard copy of it, fold it up, make it a little bit of a letter, and put it in their box or give it to their secretary or wherever things work, so that they have uh, the email and the hard letter, and just say. Let for clarity. This is what you want. This this is what you want. And then uh, a couple of weeks later, and thinking about one principal, uh, the order would change, and I would say, okay. And then I would say, just for your clarity, this is you said this at our depart department meeting, which counters what you said at the faculty meeting. Would you mind? I'm gonna come in. Would you just mind signing your name off on this so I'm clear and I can tell. You know, well, for me, I was a department head, but so I can tell my staff there is a change. Here's the boss's name on it. By the way, right there, 
99% of the problems I ever had stopped. One of the things, especially if you have a flighty boss, and that, and by the way, you everybody needs to read C. Northcote Parkinson's book, Parkinson's Law, because it is it is the most true thing I've ever seen in, in any kind of building, administration, or system. It's all true. People, <laughs> people rise to their incompetence. Um, and I would say that I was personally attacked by the principal for doing this. But my point, as I tried to point out, was that here's what we're expected to do. Here's your lofty August goals, you then threw out one through seven and eight, nine, and 10 became number one. Eight, nine, and 10 have nothing to do with my job description. And we're also throwing out the things that I actually thought were pretty good. And now you want me to focus on these things. Um, it, it made me, I'll tell you what it made me, uh, young Jake. It made me a much better coach a much better teacher and a better administrator when it was my turn. Because I realized that the most important thing, and, and I, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, repetition is the mother of implementation. And it's my job as a coach to have you do stretch one, two, three, to push your heels to the floor and jump or whatever the phrase is, stay tall, go, 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 whatever those things are. I've got to rep it, rep it, rep it, rep it. If you're my discus thrower, you're going to do lots of discus turns. If you're my javelin thrower, you're going to do a lot of javelin-related drills. If you're on my American football team, you're going to block, tackle, and protect the ball every single day. And when I became a better American football coach is when I started tossing things out, not adding. And I learned all that with a bad boss. I learned all those lessons from a bad boss to the point that um, every single day I have my pirate map. Uh, it's, it's also on the back of my computer. Every single day begins and ends with, I mean, this, this thing I do every day. Repetition, repetition, repetition. I gave you some ideas on how to build, uh, deal with it. Uh, I am also gonna tell you that Bad bosses are bad bosses for lots of good reasons. And most of the time is because this is probably their last stop, their last stop on the chain upward. <laughs> and good luck to you. Kyle has a question. What are your thoughts on the program in the good morning as a hinge movement? Would you use them as a main lift, easy strength style, or as an accessory hypertrophy movement? Uh, you know, I like good mornings. <laughs> okay, I think the good morning is an excellent exercise. And now let me throw all the caveats out, all the warnings out. First, with a young athlete, the barbell sits on the back, so you have all the issues with barbell sitting on the back. You know, and a lot of you know a lot of my female athletes don't like the bar in their back. They don't have the trap or the mass up here, and it hurts them. I actually know people who've actually had some neck and shoulder issues from the barbell. So, okay, caveat number one, barbells on the back. Number two, the position of the back squat and the position of the good morning look pretty much the same at the start. When I teach 14-year-old boys the, the good morning, they start doing that weird good morning back squat after a few, a few days. The other thing, uh, it's very easy to load, overload the back, uh, the good morning, just like the back squat, I guess. Uh, I, I like to teach the, the good morning as butt back, butt back, butt back, butt back, butt back. My hamstrings are on fire, come back up. Um, there's 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 a lot of, uh, next one, finally. There are a lot of variations to the good morning. So I almost have to stop here and say, what do you mean by the good morning? Is it the straight leg, the bent leg? I like the one that looks like the Romanian deadlift. After all that, if you're going to do easy strength and you've done... Uh, let's just do it this way. You've done rack deadlifts for uh, a round of um, easy strength, 40 days. You've done uh, Romanian deadlifts, excellent uh, easy strength uh, movement. Then doing to this good morning done correctly, yeah, I think it's a pretty good, I think it's a pretty good movement. 
You mentioned here uh, hypertrophy. Um, I worry. I would worry about the good morning and a hypertrophy program only because the reps get high, and if I don't like the idea of you, 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 you know, getting into hinge with the weight up there. If you make a mistake, you're you're in a tough position. Uh, for hypertrophy, I prefer the hyperextension. If you want lower back hypertrophy, I like the hyperextension. This is what Dick Notmeyer taught me, and I really got a lot out of it. And then I do like that one thing called the reverse hyper, if you have the equipment and if if you if you know if you do it correctly. Boy, you'll notice doing it correctly keeps showing up over and over. And I and I like that. And I'm not being a broken record. Um, I went to a comedian the other night who said these young kids don't even know what a broke. When they say broken record, they don't even know what they're talking about. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, I know I say done correctly a lot. But it's important because when you're playing in the hinge family um, or like the earlier question about doing uh, ballistic rotation work. Yeah, you know, you might have, you know, Billy over there do it without any issues, you know, this guy. And then one person does it and they get that ooh feeling and, you know, they're out for months and it couldn't be uh, a long term issue. Kyle. If you do decide to do easy strength good mornings, uh, make sure the first two weeks, so, you know, we're doing about eight weeks, I guess. Make sure the first two weeks are done with really reasonable loads and really excellent technique. And after that, you know, run with it and see what happens. And get back to me if you can. I'd like to know. Uh, Eric asked a question. Um, When you or your clients train, do you ever train to failure? Um, I like training to failure to be a bit more natural. Uh, you know, I certainly understand the value of force reps for hypertrophy work. I understand uh, going to failure for hypertrophy work, bodybuilding conditions. I mostly train athletes. I, I'm now training more and more seniors. I'm training more and more middle-aged people. Um, the, the benefits of training a failure, the, the cost, I think, a little too high. Um, and I, I don't mind, like, you know, my athletes will fail on lifts sometimes because they're heavy. <laughs> but that's not training a failure, okay? Um, if you're going to do it, uh, my biggest concern is make sure you don't, well, if you're doing exercise like bench pressing, make sure you have a good spotter. But when you're doing it and someone's touching your elbows, I'm fine if someone's t touching your elbows and helping you go. I don't like when people pick up the bar uh, because all of a sudden, I, I make this joke all the time, uh, whenever I go to a high school with big bench press numbers, I notice that mostly you find good dead deadlifters because you deadlift the bench off the person. They're, they're not, yeah. I, it's a ha ha ha. Um, so yeah, there, there's value to it in the bodybuilding world. I would prefer a train to failure. You'd be, maybe use more machines just in case something bad happens. If you're doing tricep extension of the machine and you fail and, oh, you get a cramp, it just goes like that. And, you know, you're not going to get wiped out. Uh, I hope I answered that question. Okay. Oh, um, the reason I ask this is when I sometimes talk about training with others, people always have the impression that they need to pass out from exhaustion when they are training as they have... The, yeah, as as Arnold does, or at least says he does in Pumping Iron. Uh, uh, there's a place for it if you're getting ready for Mr. Olympia. If you're not getting ready for Mr. Olympia, you know, kind of turn the page. He asked the second question. Do you plan to hold a workshop in Denmark in the near future? Um, one of my favorite places in the world to travel is Denmark. I go to Odensee, the home of Hans Christian Andersen. My good friend Oli brings me out and why don't you ask Oli to bring me out again? I love going there. And here's a funny thing. I go to Denmark, and then we get told later on that it's too far. Yeah, well, I'm not going to go to Odensee because it's too far. It's literally what people say. So I fly from western United States all the way to Amsterdam, take a plane up, take a couple-hour train over, and it's too far for someone to take the train to Odensee. And that's what drives me crazy the most. Oh, um, so there you go. Ask Oli. Oli and his son. His son is a great kid, too. Uh, look forward to seeing you all soon. 
Ross asks the final question today. I just finished Easy Strength Omnibook and I really enjoyed it. Tears form in my eyes. Uh, I have started applying the principles to my daily training and so far it's been really helpful. At the end of the book, Dan discusses Easy Strength for Fat Loss and I'm curious if you've ever read the work of Arnold Arendt with regards to weight loss. Dan talks about the benefits of fasting. Oh yeah, man. Well, remember, I got fasting from Rusty Moore and uh, I'm a big fan of the work of Rusty Moore, but fasting's been around for a long time. No one invented it. I know uh, Brad Pellin, Martin Becker, Be Be Beltram, uh, Rusty Moore, Greg O'Gallagher, a lot of, uh, Mike Brown, a lot of people I know push fasting a lot. I'm a big fan of uh, the 16-8 method, which is basically what I do. Uh, I do it partially because of, you know, for body composition issues, but I also do it for uh, my health. I do believe the research about the health. Uh, that's, well, that's funny you say that line. I believe the research. Uh, the problem with research sometimes, folks, is that uh, you get... Uh, you know, coffee is good, coffee is bad, wine is good, wine is bad, fasting is good, you should never fast. I, I, fasting has been part of human history since the first time someone couldn't find lunch, you know. Um, in fact, right now I'm fasting because whenever you're not eating, you're fasting. Uh, Dan talks about the benefits of fasting, which is something Aaron, uh delves into depth. His premise is that we get fat because we're eating foods that congest the body's tissues and prevent effective waste removal. I, I don't know if that's true. Fasting and eating and mucusless diet. I don't. Okay. Now, now, once you start running into mucus, no mu mucus. I, I'm fine with it, but it's it's not what I. Uh, that's not how I understand how the human body works. The cleansing process and allows the body to purge the fat and heal itself. Consuming a most mucusless diet, as described by Earhart, has helped me tremendously. And the idea is very simple. Dan talks about the solution to fat loss being simple. So I'm curious if he's ever heard about it. Well, first, thank you again for uh, liking uh, Easy Strength for Fat Loss. When you read my stuff, it's a little bit, it's it's very unsexy and I apologize. Uh, we I recommend, you know, um, basically try not to eat after dinner. Um, you know, uh, I, I got, I picked up this idea of sipping hot liquids all day. Interesting because a lot of people who say mucusless talk about sipping the hot uh, hot liquids too. Uh, I drink hot water. I drink a lot of ginger tea. I drink a lot of herbal teas throughout the day just to keep things going. Um, I, there are some like John Duard over there in Colorado who actually argue basically the same thing that sipping the hot water does help the body with the, you know, you know, cleaning things up. And I just noticed that I, I do, I, mean, I feel better doing it. So after dinner, you stop eating, uh, you know, try to get eight or nine hours of sleep. When you wake up in the morning, I think you should drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> and, I, and I really, when you read the, the fasted, you know, being fasted, drinking coffee seems to free up fatty acids, free fatty acids. Uh, I don't eat until after I work out and then I break my fast after I train. I train at 9.30, which means about 10.30, 11, 11.30 in the morning, sometimes as late as noon, is when I eat my first meal. I eat a lot of protein. I eat a lot of veggies. Uh, typical breakfast for me is salmon, uh, lox, uh, eggs, uh, kimchi, sauerkraut. If I do eat potatoes, it's those couple of day old potatoes. And I always, I always put spinach in my potatoes now when I fry them up. Uh, I'm also experimenting with lemon spinach, which is just delicious. Kale works well. You can't you can't taste kale when it's in there. I always eat uh, 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 sushi uh, ginger with breakfast. Also, I usually have like mandarin orange or something else because uh, I'm trying to get the plate as bright as I can. And if I can't, if there's any leftover vegetables, especially the uh, yellow, green, red peppers, whatever, I always put those in the the, the potatoes also. So a fair amount of protein, a lot of vegetables, a lot, you know, a fair amount of fermented foods. I try to have a gut biome break later in the day. That's usually a piece of fruit and uh, kimchi or sauerkraut. 
I'm, I was doing two a day. Now I'm just down to one. And then dinner would begin uh, again, a fair number of vegetables and protein. Um, that's what I think. Um, after every weight workout, I go for a walk and that's as simple as I do it. I'm using good research. I'm using the best of the brightest minds in the industry and I'm using everything that's fairly, uh, you know, that's well, nothing I just said there is, is too crazy or too insane and it seems to work. Uh, gosh, I hope that helped. I uh, really appreciate that you read the book and uh, I do have an easy strength for fat loss book. Um, I think we're, it'll come out and might be out by the time you hear this podcast and I'll, and if there is, I'll, I'll make sure we put some details in it for you. Okay. Good question. Uh, I'll spend some time looking up this author. Mucusless diets have been around a long, long time. Uh, honestly, I think it goes back to even like, uh, Kellogg's of Battle Creek, Michigan, Dr. Kellogg and some of the stuff they taught there. It's been around a long time. I don't know. When I talk to my doctors about this idea, they always kind of wave it off. But again, when people find something that works, it's always important to make sure you pay attention to that too. I have, I, I'm a big fan of research and science, but I'm also a big fan of empirical, real life. I did that experience also. So good luck to you. Well, there you go. There was uh, podcast 198. Remember, if you have questions, podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Uh, I love doing this. I hope it helps you. And each and every week I sit down. And until next week, let's all keep on lifting and learning. Thank you very much.